coming up on Garden Talk. When you completely saturate your medium and get it to what we call field capacity, and which is where you can pick it up and squeeze it, and you don't get maybe but one drop come off your hand, that's how moist your soil should start out. The stomata tend to open right before sunrise or right before your indoor lights come on. So if you can spray 20 to 30 minutes before sunrise or before your lights turn on, the stomata will open and soak up what you just sprayed on to the leaf surface. And then you have what's called a green manure or a green mulch. And then that will uh, decompose in place also and help boost the nitrogen in your soil. The best advice for anybody starting new on an organic route is do less. You're going to want to do a bunch more stuff because you feel like you're not doing a whole lot. But do less. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk podcast. This is episode 11. This episode's guest goes by the name Green Goblin 510. He is an organic gardener that grows plants both indoors and outdoors. He grows tomatoes, leafy greens, peppers, herbs, and of course, medicinal plants. He has a YouTube channel with over 2,000 subscribers, and he's part of a live stream that airs every Tuesday on CLTV. In this episode, we talk about getting started with organic gardening. More specifically, we talk about how he grows his plants with organic inputs. If you're watching this on YouTube, please click that thumbs up button. If you're tuning in on one of the podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please leave a rating and review. I would greatly appreciate it. I was actually going through the reviews and and reading them recently on Apple Podcasts, and it's super motivating to see all the positive words that were said on there. So thank you to everyone who has taken the time out to leave a review there. If you're liking these episodes and you want to support the podcast even more, you can do that through Patreon, patreon.com slash MrGrowIt. That'll get you there. And I'll link it down in the description section below for everyone that's tuning in on YouTube. All right, I have rambled on enough. Let's get into the episode. All right, Gree Goblin 510 how are you today? Pretty good, you? Good, good. Thanks for joining me. It's about time I get you on this. You're part of the, basically part of the CLTV family, right? And uh, oh, yeah. I see you on their live stream every single week. Uh, you know, I've already talked with Rob, I talked with Trey, um, and now it's time to talk with you. So thanks for joining me today. Not a problem. Not a problem. So today we're going to talk about, uh, you know, getting started with organic gardening and kind of what you do in your garden um, with organic inputs growing organically. So uh, first, before we get into the grow side of things, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into growing? Well, I got into growing mainly as a a medical benefit. Um, I broke my leg and sprang both my ankles on a trampoline and, you know, I got some injuries from that. And then just from that, I got lower back pain from trying to take care of the lower leg injuries so that um, helps out a lot and then I got into growing a lot because my mom also has an autoimmune disease and that also seems to help her out a lot nice yeah actually back in 2006 I broke my well I tore ligaments in my ankle from a BMX bike accident and I remember whenever I put my leg down like the blood would just rush down into my leg and it would be extremely painful swollen yeah and, and, and cannabis was one of the things that actually uh, solved that for me. You know, it, it got rid of my pain. So, um, you know, that's kind of one of the things that has helped me over the years. And so you have a YouTube channel. You, uh, mm-hmm. well, we got ourselves a visitor here. <laughs> <laughs> Rudely interrupted. <laughs> so you got a YouTube channel. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that, kind of what you do for videos on there? Yeah, I uh, I like to put out um, DIY like organic inputs and that you can use in your garden and uh, different weekly updates. I like to put out uh, in my you know highlighting different plants in my garden and then just teaching people as I go on how I like to grow all different types of plants. Honestly, I think I've watched every one of your videos except for I think three I missed. Very, very informative, kind of step-by-step DIY type stuff. Uh, highly recommended. I will leave a link to his channel down in the description section below so you can click on that and uh, head on over there, press the subscribe button on there, and, and check out his videos. But he's very uh, very detailed in his videos, which is something I really like. So, cool. All right, let's talk about organic gardening. So, uh, what do you typically use for a medium? 
Um, I typically uh, make my own medium. I've been te technically reusing my own medium for around seven or eight years now. Um, and just re-amending with uh, worm castings and compost and dry amendments. And you know, reworking that in there and keep using that same soil. So what does it consist of? What was kind of the star? Was it like a, a peat-based or a cocoa Yeah, it was a peat-based. Peat-based, okay. Do you know what the ratios yeah. were? On it, it was the, the the one third aeration, one third sphagnum, and one third compost worm castings. The you know what a lot of the recipes out there on the internet are. Got it. And then what type of compost do you use? I think I remember from one of your videos you used a different type of compost compared to what other people use. I like using a mushroom compost because mushroom it's a little compost. bit more um, fungally dominated. And having that little more fungally dominated compost in your soil mix helps uh, the uptake of phosphorus and potassium, which are key elements later on in the plant's life and all throughout the plant's life. But And then what do you use for aeration? Um, I like to use rice hulls and um, clay pebbles. I'll make sure of those two. The, the clay pebbles don't break down as uh, quickly as the rice hulls, and then the rice hulls actually break down a little bit and add a little silica as they do break down. So a third, a third, a third of that. Do you add any additional amendments on top of that to begin? Um, that would, would I, I would call my base soil, and yep. I would just plant like little seedlings or um, cuttings and into my base soil, and then <clears throat> I would take a portion of that and also add a bunch of amendments to that and use that for older plants, more maturing plants. Got it. Now, what and, containers do you usually start in? Uh, I usually start in either the solo cups or uh, similarly sized nursery pots. Okay, and then I'm assuming you transplant into larger containers. Um, at what point do you usually transplant, and then what containers do you usually kind of go into? I usually go from uh, the solo cup size up to maybe a one gallon, and then maybe to the, the final home. That's mainly for space saving. That makes sense. So your initial mix is has compost in it right it has nutrients already in it for the plant at what point do you do your first feeding um about 30 days in actually about two or three weeks after they're you know sprouted or cutting or whatever they are i'll transplant them into that one gallon and inside that one gallon will have some of that soil that i mixed up with the amendments and then i'll transplant it into the seven gallon and I'll also have amendments in that. So throughout that entire time span, it's getting food. And at the 30 days, I'll top dress. That makes sense. And then uh, when you transplant, are you using any mycorrhizal fungi in there? Are you adding in like any worm castings or anything like that? Or, or what? Um, I like to use a fungi, like mycorrhizal fungi when I have it. And if I don't, I'll just go straight into the soil. Because when in a living soil, there a lot of it's already there to begin with. So adding some more never hurts, but if I don't have it, I'll just go and transplant it right into my living soil. And then I don't think we talked about what si what type of containers do you use? Do you prefer plastic, uh, fabric, or, or what? I like uh, plastic when they're in the smaller containers, the one-gallon solo cup, and then fabric for the rest of the time. Just easier to deal with the smaller plants in the plastic containers. That makes sense. Easier to transplant out of, right? Yep. Okay, and then, so your first feeding comes around day 30. Uh, at that point, you're saying they're in their final containers, which you use seven-gallon containers as your final containers. What does your first feeding consist of, and, and how do you apply it? Well, my first feeding consists of literally a top dress of uh, craft plans, uh, build a soil craft plan, and uh, it has a good mixture of a little bit of everything, kelp, alfalfa meal, some rock dust, some oyster shell powder, just a nice mix of a little bit of everything. And I'll use uh, two tablespoons per gallon of medium, which happens to work out to be about a quarter cup per seven-gallon pot. I'll top dress that in, and I'll uh, rake the amendments in to the top layer of the soil a little bit. And I'll water that in. Sometimes I'll use a compost tea and water that in. Got it. We'll talk about compost teas in a little bit here. Um, now, when you top dress, do you also do, you do any mulch layers or cover crops at all? I uh, I like to use like barley straw as a mulch. Um, I heavily endorse the use of cover crops. I just don't use them in my indoor garden. 
I uh, use them more in like my beds outside and stuff like that. I, I find the cover crops in pots to be a little more work than they might be worth. If you had a decent like a four by eight um, living soil bed, that might be worth doing the cover crops as well. But uh, in uh, smaller containers, I don't see a huge benefit. Okay. Now, when do you usually, uh, when you do use cover crops, say outdoors, when are you typically planting them? Typically, probably a good month or two before the intended crop is planted in that spot. And then I assume since the cover crop's growing up, you're kind of like cutting it down so you're able to, to plant in that seedling so it's not yep. um, so light to get down. down to that spot. And okay. then you have what's called a green manure or a green mulch. And then that will uh, decompose in place also and help boost the nitrogen in your soil. So uh, often called chop and drop technique. Is that kind yep. of what you're referring to there? Yep. Okay. Correct. So you're chopping it down, putting it right down as a mulch layer on top. Uh, do you put any, um, you said barley straw, I use barley straw as well. Do you put that over um, that green layer at all or, or no? Um, if I'm using them in combination, I'll lay the, co the cover crop seed down first and make sure, you know, that's nice and watered in and whatnot. And then I'll lay the barley straw over top of it and they'll grow up in between the barley straw. And it creates a nice like mat of protection on your soil. I've been doing something similar to that, and uh, yeah, it's been working out pretty well for sure. All right, let's take a step back and talk about IPM, so integrated pest management. Is there anything that you do in order to prevent pests from getting into your garden? Well, other than doing a weekly IPM spray of like essential oils or a, a treatment enzyme cleaner, or even just water, just spraying your plants down with water, um, just being diligent of not going out for a hike and then going to visit the plants. Um, you know, just things like that, M having a very clean garden area, don't have any spots for p pests to hide. And it's a lot easier to keep them from attacking whatever plants you're trying to keep protected. And then, uh, <clears throat> another thing I like to do is, um, I'll plant different bait plants per se around my property and the, the, um, the insects will like to attack those plants more and stay away from the plants that I, I would like to keep around. What do you use for bait plants? Well, that that's kind of the hard thing to um, say for to recommend to people because it's going to be different for everybody's different location, whether you're in a more northern climate or a southern climate or, you know, a more desert arid climate. But honestly, if you want to find out the best one for your area is to go take a hike and look at ones that are being attacked. And you'll find the ones in your areas that will be great bait plants that you could plant around your area. And there's a there's an app that I like to use on my phone. I think it's called Naturalist. And you can take a photo of whatever um, plant you're looking at. And it will try to cross check it against a bunch of different plants in the world. And it gets pretty close. And it'll, you can uh, identify a plant relatively easily by doing a little bit of research and you can use that plant in your area that makes sense so for essential oil spray that you use what do you typically use for essential oils and you said you apply them on a weekly basis right yep uh every week i like to do a, a spray and i like to alternate it from the, the essential oil to maybe the treatment enzyme to maybe water to maybe neem and i'll just keep rotating them every week just to make sure that if any pest to happen to come along they uh they get nipped in the bud right away the essential oil blend is i believe it's clove um, garlic it's a bunch of different essential oils i use the essential oil blend from build the soil it just happens to be the easiest way to go about it because they blended it all together and gave it to you in a bottle off you know at a fair price and then otherwise i could go out and buy all the separate ones and mix them myself but it would get a little expensive. I would have more, but it, I'd rather support a good company and uh, get their product. Absolutely. Builds of Soil is doing great over there. They've got so much good information, good products. Um, they're definitely kind of leading the way when it comes to growing organically and, and teaching others how to grow organically. So definitely I'm good to support I'm loving his new them. series over there. Yeah. All right, so that's IPM. Now, how about foliar feeding? Do you need type of uh, foliar feeds throughout the grow? 
Um, every couple of weeks I like to do a foliar feed that consists of a full power fulvic acid um, and a little bit of kelp meal and I'll soak that in a bucket and then for maybe 20 or 30 minutes a tablespoon of kelp meal and that humic acid and then if your sprayer can't handle it you can throw it through a little bit of a coffee filter or uh, strain it out a little bit because the kelp meal might clog up your sprayer and filter that out and I'll spray it on my plants and they love it uh, the kelp meal has lots of enzymes and minerals in it and the, the humic acid helps uh, release those enzymes and minerals I've never used kelp as a foliar but I have used it as a top dressing um, and also kind of it's uh, kelp's included in recharge as well so it's kind of like a soil drench mm -hmm. um, I'll have to try it as a foliar now I watched your video on foliar feeding you have a very in-depth video and I'll link it down in the description section below so people know about this but a lot of good information, very detailed. Can we talk a little bit about when to spray? I thought that was very interesting about, you talked about the, the stomata openings and, and kind of the ideal time to spray your plants. Yeah, the, uh, the stomata tend to open right before sunrise or right before your indoor lights come on. So if you can spray 20 to 30 minutes before sunrise or before your lights turn on, um, the stomata will open and soak up what you just sprayed on to the leaf surface and it'll be a more effective foliar feed. So about 30 minutes before now, I know some people are probably watching this, probably going to be a little bit concerned uh, that, uh, you know, with droplets being left on the plant, the light comes on, that high intensity light, it could potentially kind of burn your plants due to the, the droplets kind of acting as a, a magnifying lens. Um, and I think in your video you had mentioned if you're doing a 20 to 30 minutes prior, and you have the oscillating fans on, the plant should very well be dry at that point. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. They should be mostly dry and at least uh, not, uh, no more having the water drops on the leaf surface. They may still be wet a little bit, but uh, the big drops causing the magnifying glass type effect should be gone. Also, if you um, use um, aloe or yucca in there, um, those are wetting agents, and it will actually help prevent some of those dots from even forming it'll just make a nice smooth coating over the leaf that's awesome i've been using yucca a lot lately uh, having my reservoirs just in my my uh, spray bottles that i use to spray the top of the medium um, and then also mixing it in with just uh, any soil drench that i use this stuff's awesome you talked a little bit about aloe i know on your channel you use a lot aloe in a bunch of different ways can you explain some of the ways that you use aloe uh, I use aloe for um, in my foliar sprays for cloning as a cloning gel, uh, as a wetting agent for watering, um, and for pretty much anything. You know, if I get a cut or a nick or a bruise in the, the garden, I'll use it right then and there. And it's a great, I have like three or four of them in my uh, garden, and I just cut little pieces off every so often when I need to use them and then I'm good to go I don't have to buy cloning gels or wetting agents as much um, yucca is a little bit more powerful of a wetting agent than aloe but uh, aloe also has saprons and different enzymes in it that help the plant turn on its own defense systems against pests and diseases even though there isn't a pest and disease around so I also like using that as a in my soil drenches or foliar sprays to help the plants just enact their defenses a little bit early before they run into any problems. I haven't used aloe yet, but uh, after watching your videos on it uh, and how you use it step by step, I'm definitely have to try that in the future because it's a common house plant, right? It's something that mm -hmm. a lot of people just keep around their house and, uh, you know, being able to have that in your house and then cut off a piece to use for for rooting or as a foliar spray or whatever can be beneficial. So um, that's something I'm definitely going to, a best practice I'm going to shamelessly steal from you and <laughs> incorporate to <laughs> my garden. Right. <laughs> and that's the whole point of this, this podcast really is to talk to growers from all over the world, all different styles of growing, and see what they do in their garden and that's their successful doing. Um, so people listening can incorporate in their gardens. You know, trying out these different things, it can be really fun to try new things. So... 
Um, again, thanks for, for sharing uh, tips like that because it's helpful for uh, not only me, but everybody tuned into this. So. Oh, yeah, not a problem. Got to pass the tips along. All right, so let's take a step back to uh, feeding again now. You've done your feeding in the veg stage. How long do you typically veg your plants for? Do you do any other feedings in veg, or are you flipping a flower and then doing more feedings? Usually, I'll just do that one feeding in veg. Uh, Veg might be anywhere from a month to a month and a half, depending on the cultivar. Um, Some like to be a little squatty and slow, slower than the others, and some like to shoot up and grow a little faster than the others but uh yeah usually it's about a month a month and a half and i'll put them into flower about two weeks into flower i'll use a compost tea and that's usually about it i might do a top dress right when i do that compost tea another top dress depending it if it was the month and a half i might do another top dress and the compost tea when i flip but other than that it's just water from then on so I assume the other top dress is going to be craft blend, more of the craft blend as the top dress same ratio as before. You know, maybe a little bit of insect grass mixed in there. And then for your teas, what does that consist of? Um, worm castings and a good source of compost, whether that be a mushroom compost or a regular, you know, thermal compost. And then I'll use a cup of the um, build a soil, a little bit of the humic acid and a little bit of the aloe and bubble that up for 24 hours so you usually do a, a, a five gallon bucket like what's your what's your yep. ratios for that uh, five like gallon that? bucket sorry about that yeah and then what do you do you use um, for a food source in your teas um i like to use a it's a product from florida it's a florida the raw sugar cane crystals i like to use that it's a little more easier to measure out and put into the compost tea and it's a, I find it's a little bit more of a simpler sugar for the microbes to eat. They don't have to work through the molasses type structure of molasses. You know, the, the sticky runniness of it. And it's much, it like becomes a homogenized mixture so that the microbes can eat it easier. So you don't use molasses at all in your garden? Do you use any type of sugars as a soil drench at all throughout the grow? Or is it only really sugars in your teas? Just in the teas. Okay. Now, do you use any microbial inoculants throughout the grow? Um, I definitely do. Um, I definitely like a product. Uh, Recharge is a great product. And then also, um, there's a product I use called Dr. Earth Flower Girl that has um, amendments in it. And it's also inoculated with uh, mycorrhizal fungi and a few bacteria. And when I mix my soil, I... Uh, use a cup of that along with the craft blend are you using them at all like there's a soil drench throughout the grow at all or no nope just that initial inoculation just that in the initial beginning and, that's it. and then the compost tea does give them a boost when i do that i i do maybe two compost teas the entire grow cycle do you monitor i know this is a question that um well, I was going to say you might laugh at me for asking, but it's a common question for beginners, especially the, the ones that are just starting growing organically is, do you monitor the PPM or EC at all or no? Um, the EC is kind of all right to monitor as an organic grower because that tells you how active your microbial life is. So that can give you some indication of how good your soil is. So that that number is not completely useless, but the PPM number uh, I don't use because there's inorganic and organic, you know, solids that are coming out of a, a runoff test, and we don't you can't determine what ones are which with that PPM meter. Got it. And are you doing in order to check the EC? Are you doing like a slurry test, or are you doing a runoff test, or or what? Um, there is a nice probe test from hannah instruments that you can literally just put in your soil and it will do uh, perform an ec test for you now what about ph do you monitor the ph at all either in your nutrient solution prior to giving to the plant or any type of like slurry or runoff ph test um every once in a while i do test my ph and my coming off my tap to make sure that it's you know 
around the same. I do have it filtered with a, a activated carbon filter that I replace frequently. But I do test the pH coming from the city municipal because once in a while it does change. And I might have to correct it because it will go too far one way or the other. Other than that, I don't monitor the pH a whole lot in my soil unless I'm running into issues. I might actually do a pH test for my soil. Okay, so switching over to water, you're using tap water that's filtered. Now, um, is your filter also taking out like any chlorine or, or chloramine at all, or do you have to let it sit out for an additional? People and use that, it to let it sit out for like 24 hours or something like that, so the chlorine will dissipate. That's why I do have the uh, the activated carbon filter is that it is a uh, it does filter out the chlorine and some of the chloramines. Not every fil not any filter will get all of the chloramines unless you're doing RO. But cutting it down to acceptable levels of parts per billion per billion, not million, um, is good enough for me. Now, watering is one of those things when it comes to organics. It can be a little tricky, right? Um, it's easy to overwater your plants uh, when it comes to it. Is there any, can you tell us like how you do your watering? You know, are you using a pitcher to, to dump it all in there? Are you um, using a sprayer and slowly spraying? Or, or how exactly do you water? And when do you know when to, how do you know when to water? On the smaller plants, I do like to use a sprayer to water them in the solo cups and maybe even the one gallons because it's a little bit more accurate of measurement of how much water you are giving them. Um, on the seven gallon ones, I do use like a pitcher per se. Um, that's a one gallon pitcher. And it happens to be that most of the time I can use that entire gallon for that seven gallon pot. So it works out quite well. Um, when I know when I need to water is I tell by how the pot feels, how the weight feels of the pot. And I know it's kind of a vague answer for a lot of beginners. But when you um, completely saturate your medium and get it to what we call field capacity, and which is where you can pick it up and squeeze it, and you don't get maybe but one drop come off your hand, that's how that's how moist your soil your soil should start out and be, and then you should keep it around that moisture level while allowing it to maybe drop in weight a little bit. And you can tell by picking it up and then, okay, it's a little bit lighter, spray a little bit more water in there. Okay. And then in between waterings, um, you know, soil will, will dry off kind of from the, the top down in a sense. So that top layer is drying out, you know, one of the first things to dry out, um, you know, of course it depends on grow pot. If you have the, um, the fabric pots, it might actually dry out from the sides, right? Are you spraying with a sprayer? at all the top of the medium in order to kind of keep that moist in between waterings and how if you do how frequently do you do that um and the one gallons and solos probably once a day um i'll spray a little bit of water in there just to keep the the top and the sides moist um and by a little bit of water i mean literally like two seconds per pot i'll spray some water in there and then on the larger pots um I have the good mulch layer that we were talking about earlier, which helps. And they need water nearly every day in that stage of their life anyways. So I'm watering nearly every day anyway to keep it moist. Now, what do you do for plant training? So as the plant's growing, um, you know, I, I have seen your channel. I kind of know what you do for plant training. Not sure if it's changed up uh, since you created that video, but can you talk about what you typically do for plant training? Typically, I, I might top a plant maybe one time um, depending on the cultivar other than that I like to low stress train everything out to get some uh, nice branching happening and then um, build some bamboo cages around them so they can be supported um, in the you know later stages of life yeah the bamboo cages is what I I saw on your channel I thought that was a pretty cool uh, technique for uh, keeping things upright you know because uh, some of these cultivars, I mean, geez, they get so um, flopping all over the place towards they the end do. of flowering because the buds are so so heavy. And that those bamboo style that you did uh, would definitely help with that. So that's good stuff there. Now, what about lighting? What do you typically use for lighting? Or what do you have for lighting in your garden right now? 
Uh, right now, I'm mostly LED, and I, I still have two HP oscillators left. Um, most of my LEDs are HLG LEDs. I got a 650 um, DIY kit in which I put together over on my channel. And then I also have uh, a 480 watt, uh, one of their older ones, that's a 550V2. And then I also have a, their 300 watt version as well. Nice. Definitely have some quality lights over there. Uh, I had the 100 V2 for a while, grew a plant with that, and I was super satisfied with that. They've got some really good products over there. Now, for light distance, do you have a PAR meter? Are you dialing in your light distance through a PAR meter, or are you just going by the manufacturer's recommendation, or what? Um, for the longest, I did not have a PAR meter, and I just went by um, you know, how the plants are reacting and the manufacturer's recommendation. But now I do have a power meter, so I can kind of dial it in a little closer than uh, just watching the plants and using the manufacturer's recommendations. But by getting a power meter, I did find out that I was pretty close without it. So that was nice to see as well. Which power meter are you using? I have the, the Apogee um, M500. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got that one. I also have the MQ600, 620. Um, I know the 620 is kind of the extended range one. It's good for LEDs. Um, the 500 is just that, what, 400 to 700 nanometer range. Um, yeah, I got the, but yeah, blue, the blue one, the blue sensor mm. of the Apogee. Super useful to have one. I mean, they're super expensive, right? 500 plus dollars for a good PAR meter. But being able to, you know, for energy consumption purposes, you can dim down your light and get it closer and if you have yep. that PAR meter, you can kind of ensure that you're not giving your plants too much light. Um, so I typically aim for like 200 to 400 PPFD in uh, seedling stage clones and mother plants, 400 to 600 for veg, 600 to 900 for flower. Um, and then if I'm supplementing CO2, uh, I go get a little bit higher than that, uh, maybe around 1,000 or so. maybe. Yeah. Do you monitor? What do you typically aim for there? I, I try to aim for right around 900 to 1,000 during flower, and same numbers for you know seedlings and veg. I, I don't supplement CO2, so I can't really push it too much further than that. I was going to ask if you supplement CO2, so you don't use any of those CO2 bags, any canisters, no nope. tanks, nothing like that? Just kind of relying on the air exchange? The air exchange, and I do, I do grow in a basement, and I do have a couple of CO2 sensors down here, and at all times it's around... 800 ppm so i mean i could supplement to get a couple more 100 ppm of co2 down here and maybe push the plants a little harder but i'm i'm good with what i get 800 is not bad at all i mean what is it like 400 is natural co2 levels mm -hmm. around there i know it's always changing but right now it's about 400 so being at 800 that's that's definitely a better what co2 monitors do you use um i actually um put them together myself I use a, a Raspberry Pi, and I make a whole bunch of sensors and have those sensors report back to the Raspberry Pi. Um, I'm a little bit of a geek in that nature, and, uh, you know, I like to do that myself. and Save a little bit of money in the long run, too. That's awesome. I have the CO2 monitor by CO2 meter, and it's like this round meter. It's, like, pretty okay. big. And... uh I wish they had one that would you could just hang. I mean, they do have one. I know Trollmaster has has one. We can just kind of hang down so you can get it within the canopy reading. But mm -hmm. like, I have this big round thing that I can't like shove into my canopy right now. I feel like that's one thing that's lacking right now is is good CO two meters, um, especially one that could link to your smartphone. Right? I don't even know if one mm -hmm. exists for that. I had to make one. He had to make one, right? <laughs> so I hope to see that uh, that come out from some of these companies in the future. Cool. So what temperature do you usually aim for? Um, I'm usually um, 76 degrees to up to 83 degrees in, in the flower room. Okay. That's flower. Do you do anything different for veg or seedling or about um, the same? They're about the same. Uh, all the heat and temperature that's coming out of uh, the flower room, I just pour onto the veg room and keep them warm. And then and any excess heat from there, I'll pull from the veg out of the house. So as far as air exchange, are you pumping all of the air from the flower room over to 
your bedroom and then kind of like passively intaking into your flower room. And then you have like another uh, inline fan in your bedroom that you're uh, exchanging air from there or, or what? Kind of, yeah. I have a, a intake fan on my flower room taking in fresh air. And then I have an output fan from the flower room blowing all the hot air onto the veg area. And then I have yet another inline fan pulling air out of the veg area, out of the house. And there's around 24-7? Uh, the one pulling out of the house is on a temperature um, setting. Now, how about humidity? It's another thing that, that a lot of people monitor throughout the grow. Uh, what do you typically aim for humidity in the different stages of growth? I'm usually at like 60% in veg. Maybe a little higher sometimes. If I do a foliar spray, it'll be a little higher, obviously, for a little bit. Um, I'm around the same in flower, um, 55 to 60% humidity in flower. Now, what about air circulation? So, I mean, humidity, temperature, there can be pockets of mm -hmm. high humidity, temperature. Um, so air circulation is huge. Do you have multiple fans in your grow environment? Where do you typically kind of place them within your environment? I like, uh, depending on the model of fans, some, some are a little stronger than others, but I like to place them around every four feet. So around every four feet, whether that's a, one for a four by four area or two for a four by eight section, but around every four feet, I like to use a fan and keep it on low. I always keep it on low because I like the air movement and I like the plant leaves to flutter a little bit but i don't want to push them too hard yeah that constant wind especially when you have a fan blowing directly onto the plant you'll see wind burn right the mm -hmm. the outer edges of the leaf will kind of brown up and, and, and curl down i've had wind burn so many times it's so easy uh, with some of these fans because they're so strong to, to get wind burn so um, that's a good tip to have it on low all right so we covered a lot in this episode uh, is there anything else that you can think of that you kind of wanted to talk about in this episode I mean, if I were going to add CO2 supplementation to my flower room, I would start growing different mushrooms, different gourmet mushrooms in my flower room. And that way I get another product from it and I could, you know, eat it and cook with the mushrooms. And I'd also get the CO2 from it. And that way you get kind of the best of both worlds. Absolutely. Do you have any other tips or, or tricks um, for those that are maybe watching this and just starting the organic route? What advice do you have for them? The best advice for anybody starting new on an organic route is do less. You're going to want to do a bunch more stuff because you feel like you're not doing a whole lot. But do less. Watch the plant. Do a little bit of training. You don't have to do a lot when you're growing organic and you have a, a soil set up. So don't try to do too much. Awesome advice. Really, really good advice there for sure. So how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Uh, you can find me on YouTube at Green Goblin 510, also on uh, Instagram, Green Goblin 510. Um, I got weekly update videos coming. I got um, a new Mars tent and a FC 4800 that I'm going to be doing a series in. I'm growing uh, four primal punches in there. And come check out the series. Awesome. Once again, I will link Green Goblin's channel down in the description section below. And I also link a couple videos that relate to what we talked about today. I know for the foliar feeding is one of them. I think you might have a video directly on aloe. Um, I can link that down below as well. But a uh, ton of good information on his channel. Feel free to uh, click on that and, and check it out. So Green Goblin, thank you once again for coming on to Garden Talk today. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Any final Thanks words? Thanks for having me. Awesome, uh, awesome host. Good talking with you, man. Look forward to talking with you more in the future. Sounds good. All right, man. Have a good one.